our theme through the Europe between the wars has been uh, when problems happen and leadership doesn't do a good job, people want change. And when leaders do a really bad job, people want a big change. They want a drastic change. And you saw that with Hitler and the Weimar Republic. The democracy in Germany was not doing a good job at addressing the problems. So people were willing for a drastic change, a big change. So they turned to Adolf Hitler and fascism. We saw that with Italy and Victor Emmanuel III and the social unrest caused there. People wanted a drastic and major change and they turned to Benito Mussolini, the fascist leader of Italy. We're going to go back in time. Uh, some of the stuff we're going to talk about here isn't between the wars, but it gives a foundation for Russia between the wars. We're going to be going into um, Nicholas II and a monarchy. They call their kings czars. And the czars, it can be spelled two different ways, uh, are not doing well. Nicholas II, the czar we're going to be talking about, is not doing a very good job. And, he's, and he starts to get himself in a lot of problems. And people are going to want drastic change. And they're going to be moving towards communism under Vladimir, Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, V.I. Lenin. Well, let's talk about Nicholas II. He is the absolute leader of Russia. He is the last Tsar. He's of the Romanov dynasty. And let's talk about five reasons why the people are going to want change and do not like Nicholas II. The first reason is because Nicholas II is going to have autocratic rule on the Russian people. He is going to have an autocracy, autocracy and he's going to have complete control and wipe out any opposition, no freedom of speech, no freedom of press. And this is Nicholas II right here. This is how things were before Nicholas II under Alexander III. And this is how, and Nicholas I, and this is how it's going to be under him. So people are going to have no power. And that's one reason why people don't want change. Another reason why people don't want change is the Russo Japanese War. Uh, what ends up happening is Nicholas II declares war on Japan over Korea and Manchuria. All you need to know is Nicholas II picks the fight and he loses. Anytime you pick a fight, anytime you have a war and you lose, the people, it, it's devastating for leadership and the people, generally speaking, want change. Okay? Well, a lot of problems started to rise under Nicholas II and some people think of Nicholas II, they think of the Disney movie Anastasia where he was his really nice father but in actual reality he was a good father when it came to his family but when it came to leadership he did not do a good job and one example of him not doing a good job is the fact that he didn't own up to his mistakes when he failed in the Russo-Japanese War he ended up doing something called a pogrom and that was the mass killing of Jews here are the pictures of it right here this is in 1904, well before Hitler gains power in 1933. So this stuff happened way before Hitler was even on on the scene. I don't really think Hitler's the only one going after Jews. Um, there's a newspaper article that said Nicholas II encouraged the idea of uh, the statement, down with the Jews, let us massacre these monsters. And so people went out and did this on Easter Sunday. So... You know, I don't know how much of a role he played in causing that to happen, but he certainly was anti-Semitic. Um, he's an anti-Semite, and he was against the Jews. So, autocratic rule, Russo-Japanese war, those are two reasons. Here's a side thing I just wanted to talk about. A third reason is Bloody Sunday. There are two Bloody Sundays. I don't want you to think the one in Ireland. This is the one in Russia. Uh, 200,000 people, workers went to the Tsar's Winter's Palace in St. Petersburg and they asked for better working conditions, personal freedom, and these were an innocent protest. It was just, we, we want these freedoms. And well, 200,000 people, I don't know how innocent that can be. That's, that's pretty intimidating. Nevertheless, it was led by a guy named Father Gapone. You don't need to know that, but it, he was a, I believe he was a priest. So uh, my point is, the, the intentions were not to be like the march to Versailles, where we're going to cut off heads and we're going to be at violent. These are people 
Um, look, that's little Nadia right there. Look, look how small she is. She's not violent, and this guy's like going at her. Okay, so here are the king's guards, and they're shooting down the people. That's Bloody Sunday. That doesn't make, for obvious reasons, Nicholas II look good when he's shooting people that are asking for better working conditions, bread, things like that. So that's the third reason. A fourth reason is a very, very big reason. It's um, World War II. Okay, let me find World War II. I'm sorry, World War One. Here it is, World War One. Um, Russia is the job of Nicholas II because he is an autocratic ruler was to get Russia ready for war. And when war failed, it was Nicholas II's fault. Well, 1914 comes along. Russia get Nicholas II gets Russia into this World War One uh, by mobilizing and trying to protect Serbia. It is an absolute disaster. More Russians are dying than in, than in any other country. They are struggling, and people are getting very upset about that war. And the final reason deals with this man. Don't look into his eyes, ladies. His name is Rasputin. Okay. Rasputin um, had hypnotic powers. Hypnotic powers. They called him a holy man. And there's a lot of stories with Rasputin. And uh, I'm not going to go because of time. I'm not going to go into them. If you were in class, you know those stories. And let me give you a quick background. This is Nicholas II and his wife. And they had four daughters and a son. Um, Maria, Olga. I love that name. Tatiana and Anastasia. Anastasia is what the Disney movie is named after and there's rumors that she fled and wasn't killed. We'll talk about that if we have time at the end. But here's the main story. Alexei, the heir to the throne. Well he was a hemophiliac and he that means if he got if he got a small cut, he could bleed to death because his blood didn't clot. They were on vacation, I believe it was on vacation. He gets in a bad accident, the doctors can't fix it. And he hears about this holy man, so he says, bring me Rasputin. And Rasputin comes to Alexei and says, look into my eyes, Alexei. You are healed. And Alexei is healed. Pretty interesting stuff. Lots of historians talk about it. Lots of people um, read into that. I'm not going to give you any Harry Potter, Potter hokey pokey smurf stuff on that. I don't, I don't know what to think about that. But Rasputin was able to heal Alexei. This brings Rasputin into the royal family. So when they go to Raystown Lake, uh, Rasputin's invited. Ocean City, New Jersey, Rasputin's invited. He's going to be hanging out with the royal family. And he gets in with the royal family. It doesn't take much. And he is someone that is not a good person to have as being attached to your family. Rasputin would make selfish decisions. Rasputin made decisions that were all about him. Key political decisions he made, and he made really bad decisions. Uh, he actually has ended up killed, but Rasputin le leaves a very bad name with Nicholas II. Uh, the story of his death is really interesting. I suggest you look it up. We talked about it in class, if you didn't hear about that. Um... So let me recap quick the reasons. Autocratic rule is why people are starting to get upset with Nicholas II. Bloody Sunday. Drug into World War I. Loses to Russo-Japanese War. And this guy named Rasputin being part of the family. Rasputin was a ladies man. Um, see all the ladies all around Rasputin. It was told that no one could resist Rasputin. Okay. So there you go. Let's move on now to this guy. So people want change. So they're going to look to someone else who's offering a better uh, or a different idea on how to run the government. And this is going to be V.I. Lenin. Now Lenin has some personal gripe against um, the Tsar because his brother was killed or he was hung <coughs> when he's 17 years old. <coughs> but that said, here's Lenin. He's going to be a communist or he's going to be a Marxist. He's going to be all about the factory workers rising up and overthrowing the factory owners. He's going to be for the proletariat, the working class. And he believes that they should rule the country. 
and not some dictator, not some king, no autocratic rule, but he is for the people rising up. And he's going to be called he's going to start the party called the Bolsheviks. And the Bolsheviks they're going to be um, a very radical group, a small number of committed people willing to sacrifice everything for change. Now, V.I. Lenin is going to... I'm going to skip something called the March Revolution. I'm just going to fast forward it to V.I. Lenin challenging the government. And Nicholas II is kind of in there as well. I'm going to go right to the Bolshevik Revolution. So let's talk about this thing called the Bolshevik Revolution. While he's getting more and more people to follow him, he makes three promises. Peace, bread, and land. The peace he is, re he is referring to is World War I. Get out of the war. A lot of Russians love this because he's saying, look, World War I is a stupid war. It's absurd. It's all about rich people trying to get richer and benefiting by getting more colonies, by getting more power, and yet the poor people are fighting it. World War I, he says, is all about the rich and it is nothing to help the poor, the factory worker. So he's saying, let us end that silly war. You can easily see why he would get support. Another one is land. If you remember, we talked about the French Revolution at the beginning of the year, with the first, second, and third estate, and the first and the second estate, they were the wealthy, and they controlled pretty much most of the land, and then you had the poor controlling very little. Same exact concept with, the Russia, with Russia during the Bolshevik Revolution than with the French Revolution. Lenin saying, look, that first and second estate, this first group, the church, the Russian Orthodox Church, and the nobility and these people that own land, I'm going to take the land from these rich people and I'm going to give it to the poor. Okay? I'm going to do that with the factory workers too. I'm going to give the factory workers better conditions and, and then let the factory workers, let the Soviets rise up and take over the factories so they can spread the wealth equally. Again, he's all about equality of wealth. And um, we'll see how that all pans out. So there's going to be a showdown. In 1917, the Bolshevik Revolution occurs. And Lenin, under the Bolshevik Party, they end up gaining power. So they get power. But right when they get power, they are going to be challenged. So it's not easy streets. They're going to, people are going to be questioning, yeah, Lenin, you think you got power? I don't think so. So what ends up happening is something called the Russian Civil War. And that lasts for uh, three years. And while it isn't as long as World War One that lasts for four years, about nine million people died in World War One. A total of fourteen million people die in the Russian Civil War. So more people die in the Russian Civil War um, than dur during the Russian Civil War than during World War One. I. I think that's pretty interesting because it's not a popular civil war. Well, the two sides that I want to talk about are the whites. The whites support Nicholas II. He's still alive, and his and his um, Tsar dynasty, the Romanov dynasty, and those are for democracy. And then you have the Reds, who are the Bolsheviks, and they're going to be the ones that support democracy. Okay, so they fight it out. Three years later, the Bolsheviks and the Reds win, and the Whites lose. And when during the Civil War, Lenin decides to make an um, to because the whites are, are gaining power. There, uh, um, the, at times it looks like the whites might win this um, Civil War. Lenin gives the order by um, in a small town called well, I don't know how small it was. It's in um, Siberia, Ekaterinburg, um, and it ends up the Romanov family is killed. Anastasia Maria. Olga, Tatiana, Alexei, the heir. I read somewhere that Alexei was the hardest to kill, or took the longest to kill, which is odd, because he was a hemophiliac. Bullets would bounce off their dresses because they had jewelry in their de dresses they were hit hiding. But they took him in the basement of this house and killed him. And there's a big cover-up, and because of this big cover-up, there's all these rumors on, did Anastasia survive? And that's where you got that whole Disney movie where that came about. Um, right here that Anastasia did survive and found true love in, in, in Paris. Not true. She was brutally slaughtered by the Communist Party. Yolkov Yurovsky, I believe his name was, if I remember right. But, um, he's all, c the, the Romanov dynasty is killed off. Lenin gains power. Now, if you remember, communism was all about the workers rising up and sharing the wealth. 
and Lenin's kind of would get out of the way and let the workers go. It would kind of be like um, a, well, Karl Marx called it a dictatorship of the proletariat. But what that means is the poor would share the wealth. There wouldn't be really a need for the government. But like most people, Lenin, right here, Lenin is greedy, and he's not going to want to give up that power. So the farmers, that he promised he would give them land, well, he gives them land, but the farmers are now going to farm for Lenin. The factory workers, well, he, he gives the factory workers, um, kicks out the factory owners, but now the factory owners are going to work for Lenin. Lenin and the Bolshevik Party and the, these communists are going to control the government, and now he's the one in charge, and they're going to be working for him. Now, he's going to give the farmers, the poor farmers, more things, a little better life. Factory workers, a little better life. But it's not that much greater, and it doesn't pan out to be, uh, from what I've read, um, as great as what they were hoping for. So there's a lot of people that were, um, this isn't kind of what you said, Lenin. And, but there are people that still have a high view of Lenin in, in Russia. I don't know how, how, how much of that view is, if how, how popular Lenin is still today. But the point is, he doesn't step down. He, he uh, the Soviet uh, Communist Party keeps their goals, keeps their power. A single party is controlling things. And that's how it ends off. The Bolshevik Revolution, they win the Civil War. Lenin is a power. He's controlling the farms. He's controlling the factories. If you were wealthy and you were a wealthy farmer, life was hard for you. He kicked you out. You probably actually starved. You died. If you're a factory owner, he would kick you out, possibly kill you. So if you had any wealth, Lenin went after you, and it was not good. And there it is, the Bolshevik Revolution, Lenin gains power, Nicholas II, why he was not the greatest of leaders, and then what ended up happening to his family.